Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Journey of an Awakening Spirit. This is Kathleen Flanagan, your host, and we're streaming on the Bold Brave TV network. The purpose of the show is to help you realize that you are not alone and that you are in control of your life. It doesn't matter where you came from or what your circumstances are. We've all experienced pain, suffering, hurt, abandonment, loneliness, and hopelessness. The show is to hear is here to help you turn those dark moments around and create a whole new you. Despite your success, you have felt lonely, angry, frustrated, or even suicidal. Do you long to be supported, recognized, and respect for who you are, not just for the awards and accolades on your walls? You don't want to be known, identified, or remembered in a way that feels fraudulent because you achieve things out of obligation and not passion. Do you find yourself sitting quietly at lunch, listening to your lights, listening to what lights you up only to feel shame, fear, frustration, and resentment? Your inner turmoil and limiting beliefs surface, making you feel not good enough and afraid of doing something different. You've read the books, attended the seminars, and practiced, practiced new concepts and principles, yet you still find yourself in the same rut. The lies you tell yourself perpetuate a cycle of disappointment. You say you'll change, but your self-limiting beliefs keep running the show, creating a self-fulfilling prophecy. As a certified coach, I empower you to become your authentic self. My Soul Journey program aligns you with your true self and guides you to find your soul vision, helping you discover your purpose in life. I provide tools to step you into your true magnificence and remember who you are. If you are interested in learning more, contact me at BraveTV at KathleenMFlanagan.com. Check out AwakeningSpirit.com, an aromatherapy based body care line offering alternative healing remedies using natural and organic ingredients. Use the coupon code BRAVETV to receive a 40% discount. The products are guaranteed. And if something isn't working, we can reformulate it specifically for you. Visit grandmasnaturalremedies.net, a CBD company that includes essential oils in every blend and either broad spectrum or an isolate. Every product is tested and the lab results are on the website. Use the coupon code BRAVETV for a 20% discount. Each week, we start the show with the sound of tuning forks bringing in love, happiness, and balance to set the tone for the show and bring out the best in both myself and my guest. Let's begin. Phyllis Leavitt graduated from Anacoke University with a master's degree in psychology and counseling in 1989. She co-directed a sexual abuse treatment program called Parents United in Santa Fe, New Mexico until 1991, and then went on into private practice full time. As a psychotherapist, she treated children, families, couples, and individual adults for 34 years and have worked extensively with abuse and dysfunctional family dynamics, their aftermath, and some of the most important elements for healing. She has published two books, A Light in the Darkness and Into the Fire. As a podcast guest, she would like to talk about her latest book, America in Therapy a new approach to hope and healing for a nation in crisis. She lives with her husband in Taos, New Mexico, and is retired from psychotherapy, psych, yeah, psychotherapy practice, focusing on writing and speaking. Welcome, Phyllis. Well, thank you so much, Kathleen, for having me here with you today. Oh, you're so welcome. And I want to start the show a little bit about your journey of becoming an an awakening spirit, because I did read your book and 
oh my God, it's just that good. So, but I want people to know a little bit more about you before we dive into your book. Well, thank you so much. And I really appreciate that because, you know, I, I've, I've definitely been on a journey and um, as a child, uh, just to sort of put it all out there, I, early on, I had abuse in my childhood that I completely buried. I was very young. I think it was probably pre-verbal. Um, I just buried it. And as we, most of us know in the field of psychology, the effects of being harmed by other people don't go away. They can just get buried and go underground because we're just doing the best we can to survive. Um, but how that manifested for me was, it was as if I just always felt like there was something wrong with me. I didn't fit in. I didn't belong. I wasn't like anybody else. And I didn't know why. So I was very much a mystery to myself. And I grew up in a time where people didn't talk about feelings. Nobody talked about emotions or psycho psychology was not even a topic. There was no language for what I was experiencing. And so as a result of that, I just felt like there was something intrinsically wrong with me and I didn't know if it could be fixed. Um, but, you know, it became sort of my lifelong longing to, to just to find some kind of truth, but even more than that, to find a connection to, I would say very simply, a connection to love, um, which I was not feeling and didn't know if it was possible actually for me. Um, and, you know, I, 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 so I just became a really good student. I studied and I got A's and that was my way of feeling like I had value. Um, and fortunately, I loved that. I loved learning. I loved reading. I loved writing. I started writing poetry when I was 13, I believe. And the very first poem I wrote, I had that connection. I had this magical connection to my deepest self, to, I would almost say divine love, because it lit up my whole being. And so writing became you know, a place that I turned to find that connection. And sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't. Um, most of the time it didn't, but I kept trying. Um, anyway, long story short, I uh, joined a spiritual group when I was in my 20s and I got married, I had three children and, I, and everything kind of came crashing down. I was in a very dysfunctional relationship. Um, I was very, very depressed. And I, I started to remember what happened to me. And for the first time in my, and so, so I want to say this because it really was an important part of my journey. I had this very profound realization at one point um, in the very beginning of that journey. And so I had been in a spiritual group. I was doing a spiritual practice. I definitely had some experiences of deep connection and awakening. And they were always followed by sort of a plunge into darkness. And the way that I interpreted that was the light was lighting up the darkness that I needed to heal. Um, and I kind of knew that. Um, and so I had this moment where I realized that I felt so unloved by people that I was trying to get God to love me. And when I had that realization, I knew that I had to heal something in my own heart and that I really wanted to be loved by people. And God can't be a substitute. Spirit and all those things are freaking amazing and beautiful. Um, <laughs> but there was healing to do in my ordinary life. And that was when I went to therapy for the first time and was the first time I realized that your early conditioning has everything to do with how you feel about yourself, your coping mechanisms, the beliefs you have about who you are, who you can become, about relationship, about women, about men, about it all. Um, and it was a journey. You know, I feel like I really went into the underworld and I felt um, it was scary. It was... Um, you know, I always say it this way, it was scary, but the quest for the truth about who I really was and what had happened to me was so, such a driving force that nothing could have stopped me. Um, and, you know, and I, and I guess I would share that 
um, in that process, I really did contact my most essential self. I called it my soul because that's how that was the language that came to me. And and then my first two books, uh, A Light in the Darkness and Into the Fire, are all about that journey and the contact I made with a great deal of divine wisdom and guidance and deep understanding of my of my journey really through lifetimes is what came to me. Um, and so that that was profound. And then, you know, I, I had a private practice um, and I worked with hundreds of people and children and families and couples and individual adults. And I started to have quite a long time ago, I started to have this realization that the family dynamics that I was working with that are that either, you know, are healthy and and really help us. Um, embrace our true worth and self and our gifts um, and our, you know, and our imperfect ability to relate well with others, um, that, that unhealthy family dynamics and abuse and neglect um, not are, are not only happening widespread in America, because I saw so much of it in my practice, but that we live in larger and larger family systems. A school is a family system. A community is a family system. A place of business is a family system. A house of worship is a, operates on a family system dynamic, for better or for worse. And so does a government. And so I took that lens of family systems and I looked at our country through that lens to identify what I think isn't working and causing so much divisiveness and violence today and what the whole field of psychology has to offer that could really help us heal as a country as well as as individuals and in our homes and in communities so that's kind of my story in a nutshell <laughs> <laughs> okay so i'm gonna we have four minutes before we take a commercial break so what i want to okay. do is just talk a little bit about um, what you, when you went into that deep, dark place in the recess of your soul to find where you came from. Because when I wrote Dancing Souls, it was the same thing. It was a trilogy mm -hmm. of that journey of going into the deepest recesses of myself, because I, like you, have been abused on so many levels in my life. And it's just recently, and I mean, seriously, this recently finding my voice almost to the point that it's wow. like this week that there's like this whole new part of me that's opened up in a way that i didn't when i thought i shared it but i'm finding i never went really deep into some of the deepest fears and feelings that i've had like there's this whole new thing okay. that's happening and i just want to like get some of insight because it sounds like as we heal through our process and we start opening up and feeling safe and secure and love and all the things that we do, that there's like a whole new layer that seems to come the more we open and share and come out with the world. And I'm wondering if that's something that you felt and feel based on how you wrote your book. Oh, a hundred percent. I mean, before I did any of that deep inner exploration, I couldn't talk about feelings. It felt like it felt like my throat was closed. It felt like there was an injunction against it just it was sort of like my whole psyche would just lock down, even though I would have something to say and something I wanted to say, it just couldn't come out. Um, and really, when I was in some of that therapy, I actually did a lot of screaming. And I think that that opened my throat up. Um, it was scary, you know, because it sort of came out of my body without my conscious decision for that to happen. Um, but I think it started to, and my body would shake and my teeth would chatter. And I began to know that when that would happen for me, that I was at the truth that my body was releasing mm -hmm. something that it had stored for so long and had kept such a lid on in order to protect me from the pain that was in there um, and that I was releasing it. And I, and I understood that. I, you sort of like, there's an intuitive sense, I think sometimes of what's actually going on, even though nobody explained that to me. I just knew that. Um, and I'm sorry, I lost the thread of what your original question was. <laughs> Oh, no, that was it about just 
that as you continued your healing process is basically what it was is as you continued your healing process is that what led you to write the book that you wrote are you talking about my most present book or the first one yes yes present one yes oh absolutely i mean absolutely so what happened in my healing process is i really did make like incredible very um auditory contact with my highest self and i would hear messages i would write them down and that's what my first two books are largely about and they're also highly autobiographical about you know what was going on in my life at the time um, okay um can we take go ahead and take a quick commercial break and then we'll yeah. continue on with this because sure. i know we're going to go down a really great rabbit hole oh yay <laughs> Welcome back, everyone, to the Journey of an Awakening Spirit. This is Kathleen Flanagan, your host, and we're streaming on the Bold Brave Network. And I have Phyllis Leavitt in the room with us today. And we are talking about basically childhood traumas, what that's done to us, how we we had to learn to find our voice, what we went through on healing. And Phyllis, mm -hmm. Phyllis is going to go down and talk about that a little bit more and then how that moved into her book that she wrote mm -hmm. about America, because I believe that her book, I don't know how we as a nation can do this other than we do our own healing, but it gives us a sign that there's a way that America can heal. And I really want to dive into the correlation of us individually in our healing process and what Phyllis went through and how it, maybe we can take that into helping our, our country. And it's not just our country, yeah. it's all countries, it's the world. So Phyllis, I'm going to turn it back over to you to pick up where we left off before the commercial break. Well, what I would, would want to share is that one of the greatest gifts of the psychotherapy that I did myself and that I learned how to do as a practitioner myself with, you know, so many hundreds of clients over the years is that we plumb the depths of our early conditioning what happened to us that set us up to believe and feel and behave the ways that we do and all of that can be applied to a nation a nation also has a history the, the people in that came here had a history that they brought with them they brought their unhealed wounds they passed them down and they formed part of the way that we behave as a nation the, the policies we've endorsed the kind of pursuits that we've gone after and all that so for me going down into in a safe place with a safe person and beginning to really remember the traumas that happened to me and release the pain from my heart and from my body um, and release some of the um, incorrect thinking that was associated with that the negative beliefs in particular that i adopted about myself and other people opened up something that was buried even underneath that which was the connection to my true self my essential self and so i see um, our spiritual pursuits and the pursuit of mental health and wellness and healing as intricately related to one another and i've seen that happen for many clients that as they peeled back the layers of the faulty conditioning they received they were able to contact something very deep, very essential. And what I will say is in my experience, that deep essential self is always more loving. It's always more kind. It's always more patient. It's always more tolerant, not perfect because we're still human, but, but it opens up a source of love that I know that I wasn't able to access before I did some of that healing work. And I could feel that I could feel my, the ways that I was cut off from love and belonging and cut off from giving the love that I knew I was capable of giving. So that's just kind of what I, I wanted to say about that. And then, you know, as, as years passed, I did a lot of this kind of writing and getting guidance um, and sharing that with, with a number of other people and then writing my first two books. I, it was actually a very specific moment um, when I was in, you know, in my own, my own kind of made up way that I meditated with a lot of breathing and a lot of, I, I did a lot of work with my chakras, um, which I had learned 
from my own inner guidance of how to work with the chakras. And it was in a moment of that kind of meditation that I heard a direct, a direct guidance saying to write this book. Um, and that, and it was so powerful. The message came in such a way that was so powerful that I knew that I was going to write it. Um, and I began to work. Yeah, go ahead. No, what I want to say is, and I think this is part of what you were saying when that message came in, because how you opened the book with the Statue of Liberty in your office was beautiful because it was like, I mean, I want people to have that experience of what that, because what that did, it moved me like, because you think that she's an inanimate object, but she's not. I mean, it's Lady Liberty. I mean, right. she's real. She's a real angel in, and she's here to protect and guide us. And when you brought her into the therapy room where she came to you and how that unfolded was so beautifully orchestrated, I want people, you to share with people about how that came about and how the book formed around it because it was so beautifully done. And I think that's what touched my heart the most was Lady Liberty was asking you for help. And you know, and when an angel asks us for help, you know, there's a reason behind it. So I would right. love for you to go a little bit deeper into that part of how this started for you as well. Yeah, well, one of the things that I want to say about the whole book, and this part really um, is part of that, is that I really wanted what I wrote not to be an academic book. I didn't, I wasn't writing for psychotherapists. I wasn't writing for the healing community alone. I mean, certainly I love it if anyone who is a psychotherapist reads the book, but I was really written, writing it for the man on the street. People who don't necessarily have any training in psychology, don't know about psychology, don't know anything about family dynamics or interpsychic, you know, the workings of our psyche inside. So I wanted the book to be very personal and one of the ways that I, and I was working with a, a wonderful developmental editor, let me say, I'm not going to take all the credit for the fact that Lady Liberty <laughs> is in the book, um, because it, it came out of actually one of our coaching sessions, um, that I wanted the book to be really personal. And I felt like Lady Liberty is such a powerful symbol of freedom and welcoming. And, uh, you know, it just she stands at the at the harbor, right? And um, and I think we've lost touch with her, just as we've lost touch with ourselves, so many of us, and just as I think our country has lost touch with what it means to be a nation among nations in, in a world where we need each other so desperately. And so she became a symbol for me of, of America and a person you know, in therapy. And she seemed like the perfect symbol of that. And so I just talked to her periodically throughout the book. Um, and, and I end with, you know, a conversation with her that actually when I read the end of my book, I still cry. So, um, <laughs> so that's really how that came about. And I'm very grateful for the collaboration of, of my mind and my, my editor's mind because it really, it just produced this gem. And, and it speaks to, it really speaks to, we don't do this alone. You know, we're better in collaboration with other people. We don't know it all. I don't have all the answers. I'm just offering the ones that have come to me through the work that I've done. I agree with what you said because you really did bring you into the picture. I mean, you really did open your heart. You did expose some very gut-wrenching experiences in your healing process that I truly identified because I went through that too. I went through the screams. I went through the anguish. I went through, you know, just that moving through that self-loathing and why me and why am I here? Mm -hmm. And this isn't what God wanted. And why do I feel worthless and full of shame? And, and I didn't even do anything. You know what I right. mean? I was right. just born. And right. I'm like, I don't understand. But, you know, that's some, that's some very, very, very hard work. And I met this woman in Cabo a couple of weeks ago. And she came up to me and she asked me, well, what's your trauma? 
<laughs> All right. I, I mean, if you under, if you knew who the woman was, it would make perfect sense. Okay. And so I told her. And then she sat there and told me what her trauma was, which was, well, you would never know that because she's so shut down and closed and isolated. But she has these big dreams, right? Very big dreams. And so we did this particular exercise in this seminar. And we, we were in a meditation, then we came out because they told us what they wanted to see their vision in three years, right? And we're going this meditation, we come out. Now, I just had this major breakthrough, birthing, releasing in my own personal where I went back to first cause. So I'm an emotional mess at this point. I'm, I'm just like a wide open person. And, and everybody says all their happy, happy, feel good shit to her. And I just looked at her and I said, if you want this book to be an ex a success that you want it to be, then you need to come from your heart and get out of your head. And I, and I, I didn't say that. Okay. I didn't say that that was channeled in and, mm. and I proceeded to tell her. So that's why she asked me what my trauma was. And so when she told me what her trauma was, I said, well, you have to do it. She says, well, I'm a trained therapist. And I'm thinking, oh, I have somebody for you to meet. I thought of you immediately because you're making a difference because you've allowed people to come into you. She doesn't want people to come into her. She wants to stay in her head. You're never going to make the change without that. So I commend you as a trained therapist that you're supposed to keep your stuff inside and bottled up and be about your clients. You still shared that as you're going through your clients, what your internal stuff was that came up for you during that process, which I know had to be incredibly hard to be dealing with somebody's having this fit of rage of release of intense abuse coming out. And here you are having to keep your walls up as you're going, Oh my God, this is me. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. so, well, you know, you know I would love right. for you to address that a little bit more too, because I mean, you want to help them, but you have to help yourself at the same time. And so, you know, I, I don't know how to say this, but I mean, based on what she said and what you did and how you brought 100% of you to the, your work was so inspirational, especially coming from the field that you do. Well, I, I really appreciate that. Thank you so much for saying that. And and I will share that it, in the beginning, it was extremely difficult. And I really had to consciously put some kind of safe container around my own inner world when I worked with clients. And I just learned how to do that the very best that I could. Um, so that was not easy. Um, and it's probably not optimal, but it just was the way that it was at that time. Um, but there was a true gift in it. There was really a gift in it that has never left me. And that is that I know what that darkness is like. It's not a theory to me. It's not something I read about in a book. I know what it's like to feel trapped in your own inner darkness and really wonder if you could ever get out. And when I first went to therapy, I really didn't think I could. Obviously, some part of me had hope or I wouldn't have gone. Um, for help, but it wasn't so conscious. I really felt like I'm going to be the one person who doesn't make it. And, um, <laughs> right. Yeah. Cause it feels, it feels that way. It's so yeah. overwhelming. And the, so the gift was that I get it. And so I felt like it made it very accessible for me to go into that darkness with other people, not feel afraid of it and totally know and trust that they could come through the other side because I did, you know, and the more I emerged, um, you know, and again, like you said, healing is a lifelong journey and I will always be on that journey. Um, and it's a beautiful journey, but I, I definitely emerged from the worst of the darkness and it gave me so much compassion and it gave me so much patience yeah. because I think a lot of people feel like they, and I felt this way. I felt like I, I need to hurry up. The therapist was going to get you know, impatient that I'm not making progress faster or why is she going back into that tearful place again? I needed all that time. I needed all that patience. Um, and, and it made me more patient and loving and, you know, compassionate with other people um, because I've been there. So 
You know, and I think that's part of the gift that we, we really need individually and as a society and really as a, as a human race, that there's more and more of us who understand the depths of what trauma does to people so that we can actually be there while they make their own emergent journey. Um, and the more people who do that, then the more people are available to have that kind of compassion and understanding and, and not judging the process. I mean, I was the judge of my process, you know, nobody else right. was. Um, does that make sense? So that it was no, really it, a gift in all of that. Yeah, no, I, I get that. Cause I think about, um, the grieving process when a, a loved one passes parent, yeah. whatever, you know, spouse, and people have a tough time handling the grieving process. And, and I know that I've talked to people where, when their parent passed, years and years later from a friend of theirs and they're like get over it just need to deal with it and then all of a sudden their dad dies or their mom dies and then they come back years and years later i'm so sorry because until you have that experience but what what can we do as a society that gets people to start becoming compassionate again just because they're a fellow human being you're hurting I'm hurting. When do we start taking that and, and becoming something better and just holding space for people? So what if we're uncomfortable with it? That's right. the one thing when I was younger, if friends of mine, parents or husbands or whatever died, I held space. I didn't know what I was doing back then. I had no clue what I was doing. I just would just be with them. Right. And then when my mother died and people were just being with me, it's like, oh my God, I so get what I did and why I did it. I didn't understand it, but it, you don't need to speak. You just need to feel like you're not alone. And mm -hmm. in that kind of desperate, anguishing pain, you know, and then what did somebody say? This is an opportunity for you to break your heart open more. And, you know, like, let's spin something positive about the tragedies exactly. that happen to mm -hmm. us, you know what I mean? So, I mean, if you want to talk about that or how, what you think we can do with our government or how we as an individual can like make that move into getting our governments to start doing something more than this hatred. I mean, I'm sorry, this thing with Trump the other day, that just was a, a real mind screw. Cause it's like, my God, we can't even do a presidential election with somebody being killed. And not to go political, but I know that 20 year old kid is not the one who killed president or attempted to assassinate Trump. I already know that. I know that, mm -hmm. you know, they can't even correlate anything with them. And then why was he only 400 <laughs> feet away? And our government did nothing to stop that back then because they could see it. So, you know, there's this whole thing of why is our government allowing this? So their agenda comes up. Well, in my book, what I'm really trying to do is trace some of these, the severity of like, I would say that's the tip of the iceberg, right? The mass shooters are the tip of the iceberg. The rapists are the tip of the iceberg. The people who do terrible, you know, um, acts of extortion and greed and um, suppressing and discrimination and all of those things that, that we see every day on social media, they're the tip of the iceberg of what I'm calling massive family mental unwellness and dysfunction in, a, in the family of America. And I think one of, one of the, there's several really big points that I make in my book, which if you, you know, I know you read it, so you're aware of them, that I don't think are common knowledge. And I think one of them is this, that the people who are the most symptomatic, whether it's in a family and it's the kid who's setting the house on fire or running after their siblings with a knife or they won't go to bed at night or they they cry all the time or they wet the bed or they're failing in school or they get into drugs young. The kids in a family who are the most symptomatic, and it could be a spouse also, um, are calling for help for the dysfunction and the pain that's not being addressed in the family system. They're the symptom bearers for family pain. And we have to know that the most acting out among us are the symptom bearers 
for the pain in the family of America and really the pain of the human family. And what's unfortunate um, and what is such a great cause for alarm is that some of those people are holding office. They're in positions of power and they can act out their unhealed wounds on masses of people. Um, and and one, of the, one of the things that I spend some time on in my book is what are the dynamics of an abusive or a neglectful family? And so I'll just say a couple of them briefly here so that you can see the correlation between the individual family and the individual and the macrocosm of a nation. Um, and then really, it's all over the world, but I talk about America because that's the country I'm familiar with. And that is that people who are in positions of power, like an adult in a family who has power, um, especially over their children and sometimes over their spouse, if they are themselves suffering from the unhealed wounds of family dysfunction and abuse, and they have identified with the aggressor and become like the people who hurt them, because part of what we do is repeat what we know. Some people become like the aggressor and some people become passive and are easily manipulated and hurt again. Um, if you have a parent who has identified with the aggressor and becomes abusive, they justify what they do that's hurtful. I hit her because she failed in school. I molested her because she wore that short skirt. She asked for it. I beat him because he didn't come home on time. You know, there's always a reason. And abusive governments do the same thing. We discriminate against those people because they're inferior, because they're lazy, because they're entitled, because they have a different color skin, because they have a turban. Whatever it is, we target certain people and we tend, whether we're, it's one person or a government or community, we tend to target the most vulnerable, um, the people who are have the either either the most vulnerable and have the least ability to fight back effectively, or we target the people that we really think are a threat to our holding the position of power. So, abusive people and abusive governments silence those who try to tell the truth, try to get help. Try to get, try to change the system to a more humane one, um, and these are all psychologically understandable. But let me just say, I go into great detail about what some of these dynamics are, and they're scary and they're widespread. But I don't do that to point fingers of blame at anyone, because the world of psychology is not about blame; it's about healing. It's about healing our wounds, and it's about healing our relationship with ourselves and with other people. And if we stay focused on blame and hatred and hating the haters or however we say it, we've missed the boat because then we're just perpetuating the same dynamics that generated divisiveness and violence in the first place. So the purpose, it's more like a diagnosis. It's like you go to a doctor and let's just say you went to a doctor and the doctor says, you have cirrhosis of the liver. You don't have a bad liver. Your liver, there's nothing, your, your liver was fine, but you now have cirrhosis of the liver because of your drinking. And your liver has become symptomatic to tell you that you're not taking care of your body and you have to stop drinking. And the most symptomatic people among us, whether they're in a family or a school or a business or a corporation or a government, the most symptomatic are telling us that there's something in the family system of whether it's large or small that is causing mental unwellness, is causing people to become violent, is causing people to become discriminatory or hateful or withholding or addicted. Um, and, and that I don't think is common knowledge at all. I think we're still being, we're still hearing the rhetoric that says there's just bad people out there and we have to go get them and get rid of them. And, Psychologically, we know that's not the truth. There's no baby that's born a bad person. There's no baby that's born a rapist or a murderer. Something happens to that beautiful, innocent child that sets them up to be completely maladaptive in a social world. So let's take this to the bullying because, you know, that's a big thing that goes on on, on social media, on TV, all sorts of things. Mm -hmm. I mean, they promote all of this. And 
So why don't so t- let's talk about that because there's one other element I want to talk about too, but I'll bring that up in a minute. But what do you think about? I mean, because I think our government's a bully on many levels. I've always thought that because we seem to bully everybody, and now we're kind of being is coming back at us now. Mm-hmm. Which mm-hmm. would make sense because, you know, we're mistreating, as far as I'm concerned, other people in the world. So why shouldn't we be mistreated? So let's address bullying because I know that that would be one of those symptomatic things. So I would say that the bully mm-hmm. is something that happened, you know, if a father beat on him because he wasn't standing up, I'm assuming. But I want your expertise in what creates the bullies out there. Yeah, I think it's hurt. I think it's some kind of, so, so one of the things that I always say, because it was one of my big, you know, succinct lessons from being a human being, you know, in recovering myself and, you know, working with so many people who have been hurt, um, is that the best food for human beings is love and belonging and safety and feeling valuable and a commitment to resolve conflict without violence. And when people are fed that kind of healthy emotional food, they don't become bullies. They don't. Um, bullying is a product of some kind of mistreatment at human hands. And it can be, it, it's not necessarily one thing. It could be that there's an overtly abusive parent that beat a kid or sexually abused them or just said horrible things to them like, I wish you were never born or I'm gonna send you back where you came from or you're not worth anything and no one's ever gonna love you. And believe me, people hear these things all the time. This is not like an anomaly. This happens a lot. And I've heard you know, hundreds of stories like this. Um, so some kind of messaging, whether it's behavioral or emotional or mental or all of them together from people, especially people we depend on, which is often our parents or siblings or a close family and community, if, if if children receive terrible messages about who they are and their value, they tend to be angry and hurt. And some children become passive as a result of that because they've learned that fighting back does no good, they don't escape anything, or maybe it even brings more abuse on them. And some children identify, as I said earlier, with the aggressor, um, and they become like the aggressor and they look for someone to pick on. And, and it's, it's a way of trying to, it's, an, it's a dysfunctional way, but it's an understandable psychological way of trying to discharge their own pain by getting somebody else to feel it instead of themselves. And they don't know they're doing that. It's all unconscious for the most part. Um, and then if you have someone who's identified with the aggressor and who, gets in a position of power, whether it's in a church or a business or a school or a community activity or even a friend group or a government, then there, there's a likelihood that they act out those same unconscious impulses on the people that they have power over. And we see this and it's extremely dangerous. And so I think when we look at the number of people, not just in America, but all over the world who do get into positions of power and then kind of enroll the people who are akin to wanting that kind of power, um, then you see this mass mistreatment of whole segments of the human population. And one of the reasons why I think this information psychologically is so invaluable and so urgently needed today is because you know, a hundred years ago, somebody could come up and shoot you or, you know, you know, today we could destroy life as we know it with the weapons of mass destruction that we've created. If they're in the hands of people who have that much rage and that much mental unwellness, that they're willing to kill untold numbers of people to satisfy their own need for, for power or wealth or whatever it is they're after. And we're actually seeing that. Um, I, we were, my husband and I were watching a, uh, um, a documentary last night and there was a little clip in the documentary of a video that was taken of Nixon talking to Kissinger and talking about, um, didn't, did, 
did Kissinger have, you know, the wherewithal, the balls or whatever to use nuclear weapons? Because he was thinking about doing it. And he talked about how many people it would kill as if it meant nothing. It's horrifying. Well, he was evil. That's all I have to say about him. He was a very, very, very evil man. And I mean, I go down my own set of beliefs on all of that kind of stuff anyways. So our time is starting to run out. So what, what do you think that we could do when we come up with someone like a bully or what is something that we could do that's productive that might help them? Is it just to show them love and compassion, even though they're in the middle of an abusive <clears throat> tantrum? I and mean, what, what can we do so we feel powerful and then to help them because they're not going to get the help on their own unless something unfortunately, tragically may happen to them to do that. Because I don't think that 20 year old kid deserved to die that I don't think he attempted that. You know, I mean, it's like, come on, we got to stop with this killing mm -hmm. our youth. Well, again, I just want to reiterate that the whole reason why I share anything that I share is not to blame or hate anyone because that just gets us more of blame and hate. Um, it really is to talk about the need for healing and use the tools that the best psychology has to offer to help us heal. So, you know, as you said earlier, we begin with ourselves. Whatever, you know, we can do to heal our own wounds, recover our own essential self that is essentially good, essentially loving, essentially patient and kind and cooperative, but not unpowerful. Our essential self can also have a powerful voice. It's, and, and, I, and I wanted my book to be a powerful voice of speaking truth to power with love, with care, with saying, you know, there's a good reason why you have the symptoms that you have if you're the aggressor, as well as the person we identify as the victim. There's a good and understandable reason why you have the symptoms that you have. And the cycle of abuse can be broken by, by many things. But we start with ourselves, like you said, heal our own wounds. There, but there are many people who are not invested in that, you know, today. There are many people for whom that still seems like a weakness or they just don't, don't have any access to their own vulnerability. So, you know, one of the things I say is talk to the people that you think can hear. You know, start with the people that if you really want to spread the word of love and peace and safety and kindness and compassion for human beings, and a word of really like, let's really try to get along here because that's what we all want in our own lives. Then start with the people that you think can hear, but listen to them, listen to their pain, listen to what they really want. Listen to maybe their story about why they have the anger that they have or the beliefs that they have. And maybe all you do is listen. Um, what I have found is that the more I have worked on myself, and I'm not perfect at this, and I don't know anybody who is. This is a training I'll be doing my entire life. Um, but the more that I've worked on my own healing, the more I can tolerate just hearing something that I don't agree with or that is even upsetting to me um, for the purpose of, like, often people who are very aggressive and are out to rile other people up and get them angry and get them into a fight. They want to fight. That's unconsciously they're driven to provoke other people into acting out so they can try to dominate them. And if you don't react from that place of, you know, defensiveness or offensiveness, often it just de-escalates the argument. Um, all by itself because there's no hook. You didn't grab the bait. And they're just kind of left having to reflect on themselves, if they can. Um, but, you know, but I'll just say real quickly, my book was designed to share so many, so much of the knowledge that I have received so that people could begin to be educated. I think, you know, education changed my life. Um, and so, you know, I think I'm one voice among many, many, many voices of trying to wake us up to what the roots are of what's really happening and not just react to the surface level. So how can people get a hold of you, Phyllis? Yeah, the best place to get a hold of me is my website, www.phyllislevitt.com. Um, I'm on all the social media, Facebook, LinkedIn. I have lots of videos on YouTube. 
I have blogs and articles on Substack. Um, and, you know, and also if you go to my website, I offer a free PDF. Uh, if you just, you know, sign up for it, a free PDF on the basic elements of resolving a re and repairing a relationship after there's been conflict or while there's conflict. And, um, and that's really the nuts and bolts of how we can begin to apply some of this in our own lives. Well, thank you so much, Phyllis. This was very educational and it's, it's a sign that we do have control and power and that there is, even in the psychology world, that there are ways that we can take control. And like you said, if it's just talking to somebody or not reacting to somebody who's trying to pr trigger your buttons, because that's a hard thing for most of us to do. But if we can right. stand in that place of power, that's the best and most effective way because I've seen it. I've done it myself. I've seen it with other people. And I think that's the main thing is we really do have to dial in on who we are, how we think, how we feel, be in empowerment with ourselves, heal whatever we can possibly heal. And you're never, ever, ever powerless by doing that. You are, that is the greatest strength you have is to ask for help because it's the only way out of the muck. So, Absolutely, 100%. And I just, yeah, and I just want to thank you so much for this amazing insight and I do highly recommend everybody to read her book. There is so much insight given inside of her book as far as what you can possibly do. There's hope that you're not alone. You see so many different walks of life coming through her in her book that it doesn't matter what the level is either. And it didn't matter what the age was. It was the same thing. It was hurt. They were suffering. They were in pain. And she provided tools to help them get out of that and become healthy, whole human beings. And we all have that power. So again, yeah. thank you, Phyllis, so much for being here. And I really do appreciate it. Thank you. And I just want to say the title of the book is America in Therapy. So um, thank you. And thank you for having me. And thank you for all your, your great words of wisdom. Thank you. You're welcome. So if you found any value in our show today, I would really appreciate it if you would send the link on to your friends and family. And if you like the show, please subscribe and like the show. And then that way you can be notified of up and coming episodes that are coming in. If you're struggling with anything that we talked about and would like to know, get more information on how I can support you into becoming your authentic self, or go through healing because I have a lot of tools in my tool belt as well as Phyllis. I am sure she is more than willing to speak with you as well on what she can do and what I can do. Reach out to me at Brave TV at KathleenMFlanagan.com. My books, Dancing Souls, The Call, The Dark Night of the Soul and Awakened are on Amazon.com as well as KathleenMFlanagan.com. And please visit my website at Kathleen M. Flanagan for the list of services that I do offer. And there is a free three-minute de-stress meditation that is absolutely free to you to download. And don't forget about Awakening Spirit using the coupon code BRAVETV for a 40% discount, as well as grandmasnaturalremedies.net for the 20% discount by entering Brave TV. And I will see all of you next week at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And from my heart to yours, I hope you have a fabulous week.